morning, everyone. We had another um, person who was part of our church for many years go and be with the Lord. Uh, some of you may remember her, a young girl named Amanda Palmer, and um, she's 45, just uh, again went to be with Jesus, but um, hasn't been part of the church for quite a while. But uh, Pastor Bill Osborne uh, led her to Jesus when she was a little girl in one of our kids' clubs, which is fantastic. And uh, her mum came to, to Christ, and she was our, our um, travel agent for many years. And um, so Pastor Alan let me know about it. So I rang Bill, and he said, look, he goes, as soon as I came back from Africa, she wanted to see me. They'd been in contact. And so you saw her on the Monday morning, shared with her her faith was strong, and she went to be with the Lord on uh, Monday night. So there may be a funeral here Wednesday morning or possibly at uh, Peter Elberg's funerals uh, there. So uh, if you remember her and her, her mum, Rosalie, they were beautiful people and uh, came to Christ under terrible hardship, difficult circumstance. But you know, it just shows you the, the importance of ministering to our children. And she was only a little girl and uh, Bill's daughter, Bill and Norma's daughter, Rebecca, uh, they were friends from when she was three years old. So you know, the work that Pastor Alan does on Friday nights in reaching kids and what we do Sunday mornings with our children, so important. You just don't know um, the impact of that. So, uh, um, yeah, so that's uh, a bit sad, but she's with the Lord. Uh, when a person's young, you, you, you find that a bit difficult, you know, but... Um, the other thing is you would have received a letter from me this week that let you know that there's been some changes. Uh, my new executive uh, assistant has been transformed from Esther Lane to Pastor Nathan Betcher. <laughs> I walked into the office this week and I'm looking for Esther. Where are you, Esther? Oh, it's Nathan. And uh, so by, by Friday, I was well and truly used to it. So I've sent you a letter on that, but Esther's gone back to study doing a master's degree in, in social work, which he's wanted to do. And so Nathan is, uh, at least till the end of the year, will be in that role. So when you ring or you make contact or my office makes contact with you, it'll be Nathan, not Esther. So don't call him Esther. <laughs> um, now, I commenced um, this June series last weekend and shared with you this financial fitness series. I shared with you about our facilities upgrade last Sunday. Who wasn't here last Sunday? This is not a checkup. Don't worry. We're not going to follow you. Pastor Davis put his hand up quick. That's good. We'll see you afterwards. Who wasn't here last week? Okay, guys, if you weren't here, this Hear the Sound, See the Vision brochure about where we're heading as far as our facilities development over the next three years. I uh, shared last Sunday probably about 15 minutes on this. I don't want to do it again this week, but um, you can download the message on Family Centre TV on YouTube. And so, but grab this brochure at the uh, end of the service. The ushers will have one, but it's important for you to listen to what I shared about why we're doing the, the extensions that we're doing. And uh, on Sunday the 23rd is where we take up the commitments for the next three years and also we're putting in uh, a significant offering to kick the thing off. So if you could do that, and also my message outline for today, uh, you'll be able to receive as you leave as well, because I've got a, quite a few scriptures I want to share with you. So my topic today is God's principles, laws of financial fitness. Um, to get financially fit, you need to follow God's unchanging laws and th there are several uh, biblical principles that will work for you if you align yourself to them and fully embrace them. See God's laws are stable and secure just like his character. They don't change with the wind. You know he's, he's given us physical laws like the law of gravity and the second law of thermodynamics. You know that's where hot bodies become cold and and uh, gravity, you know what that is. But you imagine if, if God said, well, I just think I'll suspend them on Mondays from now on. None of us would be around. It would be, we would be gone. <laughs> and uh, if you do a little bit of research on the second law of thermodynamics, like uh, we would freeze to death or we would all cook alive. So um, 
So God is stable, and so mayhem would result if his physical laws were suspended. And, uh, but his laws work, and it reflects his changeless character, and his laws and the principles that govern our physical and relational and physical well-being are there for our good. Um, the laws regarding health, if you violate those laws, you're in trouble regarding your physical health or relational health. If you violate known principles and laws of right relationships found in the Scriptures, you're going to reap trouble and hardship and a lot of pain. God's financial laws and principles work the same and they will bless you. If we don't follow them, we will live a stressful life filled with debt and you'll never be free from frustration, tension and worry. And there are several laws. Let me just give these to you. Firstly, remember that God is your source. Okay, this is the, the principle of ownership. Your job is not your source. Neither are your investments or your bank balance. Uh, Deuteronomy says this, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Folks, God owns it all, and what you think you own is really on loan for just a short period of time. Romans 11:36 says, for everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. So your salary is not your source and your savings are not your security. Only Christ can be our security and it's he who is the stable and secure source of all things. Never forget, remember that God is your source. And last week I shared on this uh, fairly extensively and gave a stack of scriptures as well. Secondly, honour God first. This is where the principle of tithing fits in. Whatever you want God to bless in your life, whatever, whatever department, whatever area, put him first. So when it comes to the principle of tithing, the promise of tithing, where we give 10% of what we earn to him, the promise is found in Scripture. Look at Proverbs 3, 9 to 10. Honour the Lord by giving him the first part of all your income, and he will fill your barns with wheat and barley and overflow your wine vats with the finest wines. Folks, we're not to give him the leftovers, the sour grapes. You know, the part that we say, oh, that, that, I can't sell that. We'll just, I'll just give that to God and, and that. Pay the Lord first right off the top. Because the purpose of tithing is this, Deuteronomy 14, it says the purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. And it's a practical way. So today when we did our, our, our tithes and offerings, it's a practical way. So I give electronically, so does Kathy. Uh, we give 10% of our income into the life of the church. We give another certain amount to missions, to the poor, the needy, and to our facilities upgrade the next three years. We're going to do that uh, starting on the 23rd as well. And so it teaches me to be grateful to God for the past. He has been so good, as we sang today. To be thankful to God for the present. His presence and His, and his peace and his blessings are, are, are on my life when I align myself to him. To be grateful to God for the past, thankful to God for the present, and to trust him for the future. He can be trusted. The place of tithing. Where's the place? Where do you tithe? It's where you choose to worship Jesus with other like-minded Christ followers. In Malachi 3.10, it says, Bring to the storehouse a full tenth of what you earn, so there will be food in my house. And God says, test me in this, I dare you. Says the Lord all-powerful, I will open the windows of heaven for you and pour out all the blessings you need. In the Old Testament, the storehouse was the temple in Jerusalem. In the New Testament, it's your local church. And people say, oh, well, you know, like, I just give to charity. Hey, giving to charity is a good thing. We do as well. But it's not tithing to God. Tithing, 10% of our income and our, and, our, and our goods is an act of worship at the place of worship. So where, the timing of tithing, when should it occur? Well, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 16, 2, on every Lord's Day, each of you should put aside something from what you have earned during the week and use it for this offering. The amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you earn. So he says to put aside, interesting, to put aside, and that means planned giving. It's not emotional giving. It's not pressured giving. 
you have to have a plan in advance. And, um, you know, like uh, to, to give, uh, to give uh, on CFC online means you have to plan it, you have to think it, you've got to talk about it. Say, so, okay, what can, I, what can I put in? I'll put in there through BPAY or through electronic giving. And, um, uh, and our facilities development over the next three years. Why didn't I last week show you the brochure and then say, right now, let's all make this decision and put the finance in now? Because it's emotional giving. It's pressured giving. You need time. That's why we said, look, take three weeks, reflect, pray, plan, think, talk it through. Pray, God, lead me in this matter. And so I've been to some, some meetings where, man, the offering takes 30 minutes out of a one and a half hour service. David, you only took one minute. You can take five minutes, you know, if you like. But listen. And, and so when that happens, and then they put the screws on you. The aim is to empty your pockets of any money you've got there and your wallet and all your cards. Give it all emotional pressure, 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 pressure. Well, this little black duck just goes, no way, Jose. I'm going to think about this. I'm going to pray about this and reflect on it. Why not give to my church? I give to missions. And so, there's, so, so I'm not saying don't be generous, but uh, it, it, you, you've got to prayerfully plan without pressure or an emotional appeal. That's why we're saying, look, take a couple of weeks, reflect and think of what we... Our aim is to raise $480,000 for our facilities development. I think it's 340 and about another 144 debt reduction. And that's over and above our tithes, over and above our missions giving. But you have to think and reflect and pray and say, God, guide me in this. If everyone can be involved in it, you'll see the plan in, in, in the booklet. We can accomplish this. But I want you to pray, reflect, think, trust your judgment. And if someone came up to me immediately after the service and said, here, I want to put this, I'd say, no, 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 you, you go away and think. That's, you, you're, being, you're being pressured. I admire your generosity, but you need to think and pray and reflect about this. Very important to do this. Involves intentionality, planning. So the first two laws, principles, lead to the next ones. And so these are foundational. Remember God is my source. Honour God first, most importantly. Now look, if you want to do an interesting study on stewardship and tithing, this booklet that needs a lot of editing on it, I did many years ago, but I just basically looked at all the Old Testament, New Testament verses that talked about stewardship. Because there's some people say, oh, well, in the New Testament, you know, we're under grace, we don't have to give our tithes. Well, that's just baloney. That's just not true. Jesus says in Matthew 23, 23, he says, don't neglect tithing. Don't neglect it. It goes, some of these practices in the Old Testament relate to our, 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 our functionality today. We just do it with a different spirit, a different heart. And 10% is just the beginning. And it's kind of, if you don't have a starting point, you'll never start. And so I would encourage you to embrace this principle. But now, these first two, and these are on um, where my books are in the foyer. You can get a, one of these green booklets and reflect on it. Look at all the scriptures. So these first two laws, principles, lead to the next one. Thirdly, save money faithfully. <laughs> this is the principle of investing. Hey, Jesus gives us heaps of parables, stories about material things, money, talents, and our attachment to material things. He spends more time talking about that than he talks about heaven and hell, water baptism, and a whole pile of other subjects. Why? Because he knows in living in this material world that God has made, it's easy to get our eyes off the spiritual onto the material. We, our physicality, our senses, we get attached to things and we can easily forget the person who created them, that he is the source of all things and, and, and fail to put him first in that area of our life. And so last week I shared on the par two parables, the parable of the shrewd manager, Luke 16, and the parable of the talents, Matthew 25, just two big parables to do with material things. So, but you've got to save money faithfully. Saving is a test of your IQ. Do you realize that? Of your intelligence. Your, your IQ can be determined by your savings approach. Look at what Solomon says. Proverbs 21, 20. The wise man does what? Say it with me. Saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. If you are not saving, you are merely working for your money. 
So why don't you make some of your money work for you? Follow the 10, 10, 80 principle. This is a starting off point. This is something that, that you should encourage your children and anyone to say, pay God first, 10%, not the leftovers. And then secondly, pay yourself 10%, at least 10%, and then live on the 80%. If you can't afford to save, if you say, well, I can't afford to save, you know what? You're simply spending too much. The answer is not to save, is to reduce your spending and get help in that area. Proverbs 13, 11 says, money that comes easily disappears quickly. I can say amen to that one. But money that is gathered, little by little, will grow. You might say, oh, I can't, I can't start with the 10%. Start with five. Just put aside 5% of what you earn and you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised how much that will grow and develop. Let it work for you and not against you. If you invest at least 10% of your money, it's working for you. Get this even while you're sleeping. So you're earning money during the day, but you can be earning money at night. That's just smart. That's why you can tell how, how high your IQ is by this. How many are smart here today? Don't put your hands up. <laughs> hey, it's consistency that matters. It's not the amount that matters. Compound interest is a gift. It's also a curse. And we'll come to that. If you're living on debt, compound interest is a curse. It, it just will keep you miserable as you endeavor to try and live uh, above debt. But it's also a blessing when you're saving. Hey, I dare you to do this. Your next raise, your next raise, decide not to spend it. Decide not to spend it. You're living on 80%. Say if you've got the 10, 10, 80 principle functioning. Your next raise, don't spend it. Don't spend it. Invest it. But most people go, oh, I can't wait for the next raise, you know, and CPI increase, and I can increase my spending. We all tend to increase our spending. John Wesley, who founded the Methodist movement in the 1700s, an amazing man, Anglican priest, led a revival in England, you can check this out. You can check out his famous sermon he did, oh, when was it? 17, I've got the date of it, I've got the sermon. His famous sermon. And at the end of his life, he actually told off all his Methodist followers. And he said, ah, oh, he, goes, he goes, they listened to me when we started. He goes, but I bet you only about 500 out of 50,000 will be doing this. You know what he said? He goes, we work as hard as you can. He goes, in other words, earn as much as you can. Secondly, save as much as you can. And thirdly, give as much as you can. And he said, they're working as hard as they can and earning a lot, and they're saving, but they're not giving. And he actually challenged them to say, you've got to have all three. At the end of his life, he actually told them all off. And you know what? He didn't increase his living expenses for decades. He actually learned to live on what he'd put aside, even though expenses were increasing. He learned so that he worked hard, he earned a lot, he saved a lot, he gave a lot. That's why buying brand new cars on higher purchase is such a hopeless thing to do. And if you've done that, don't feel guilty. No, feel guilt. <laughs> it's such a trap. You know why? You know why? Because you might spend 40 grand on a brand new car and you got it on, if you've got cash, it's different. But if you buy it on loan, the moment you drive that thing off the lot, from four, say if it's worth 60000 it'll be worth 45000 the moment you drive it off. And then you're paying debt to a depreciating asset. So what's the answer? Buy a jalopy. <laughs> buy something, save the money for it, buy something really cheap, then go s drive slow just in case the wheels fall off. <laughs> so be safe. Don't waste your money on buying. And young kids today, oh, they want to get their, the flashy car to start with. No, no, no. Do what I did. I, I bought one of Hitler's revenge vehicles, a Volkswagen, 1954 Volkswagen in the 1970s. I tell you, that thing just went on forever and ever and ever. And I used to date Kathy with it. As it was dying, I used to get her out to push start it. So, and then we bought a Falcon, a, a second-hand or third-hand or fourth-hand Falcon. We waited and waited. Whereas if you buy property, if you buy real estate, you buy a unit. And don't buy a flashy unit if you're starting off. Buy a dump, but in a good location. A 
good location and work like Billy O to do it up, wait five or six or seven years, then sell it, make a profit, buy something better. But at least you've got an appreciating asset if you go into debt. That debt is smart, that is wise. If you're buying shares, be careful and uh, make sure they're, they're ones that are, that are in a safe category rather than it being a gambling thing. And so get advice, make sure. We don't do that, Kath and I don't, but some people in the church here do and they're doing it very wisely. Um, it's just Greeks are allergic to that. <laughs> they like terra firma instead. So, uh, so and if you're going to buy a property, seek advice. Buy wisely. The first property Kath and I signed for on Marion Road had looked fantastic. We thought, man, this is a good deal. We got a friend who was a land agent, builder, to check it out. And he found the whole thing was riddled with salt damp and they'd put a cement coat throughout everything. We would have bought a lemon. And thankfully, the government had just brought in the 48 hours or two days or three days of uh, cooling. You know, so we quickly tore it up and said, we're not buying that one. We didn't know what we're doing. And we're both intelligent people. Two degrees and a diploma, but I didn't know anything about buildings. So you've got to get advice. Just, just make sure you get people in. So when you purchase, you purchase in the right location. Purchase the right size. Make sure the debt is manageable. It's not going to kill you, but know that it's an appreciating asset. If you ignore God's laws, you will miss God's blessing. Seriously. If you do your finances God's way, you will prosper. And both Kath and I have prospered in this. Now, I'm not saying that in, if you give, God will give to you. That's the motive. Well, if I give, then he's bound to give to me. No, no, this is just aligning yourself to God's way of doing things, like aligning yourself to good health principles. This is really important. The fourth one is keep good records. This is the principle of accounting. Write things down. <laughs> Put it on the computer. Keep track of your finances. Then you will know where it is going and not wondering where did it all, where it all went. You know, the mystery, where did it all go? You've got no control over it. Hey, you've got to write it down. You've got to keep track. Look at Proverbs 21.5. Plan carefully and you will have plenty. If you act too quickly, you will never have enough. If you don't know where it all goes, you're not following this law. Proverbs 27 says this, riches can disappear fast. Know the state of your flocks and your herds. In the Old Testament days, one's wealth was tied up with livestock. And, uh, and, so, and perhaps the amount of land that you had to, for the livestock to live on. The point he's saying is, really know your assets. Know your assets and know your regular cash flow. Proverbs 23.5 says, your money can be gone in a flash as if it had grown wings and flew away like an eagle. Everyone felt like that? I mean, Solomon's they're pretty wise. Yeah, that's right. It's like growing wings and it's flying away. You know, some people say that money talks. It doesn't talk. It just goes away without telling you. <laughs> Easy credit and ignorance equals disaster. <laughs> Easy credit and ignorance of your financial condition equals disaster. You've got to know what you own. You've got to know what you owe. You've got to know what you, what you earn. You've got to know what you spend, which, which is really another of God's laws. Number five, you've got to plan your spending. Plan wisely your three T's, your time, your talents, and your treasure. What you do with your time is what you do with your life. Your treasure, your talents, sorry, your, your, your talents, the gifts and abilities that God has given to you. They're a gift from God. So use them, whatever natural ability, whatever spiritual ability. They're not given to you to sit on them. You're, you're there to use them to help other people, to advance the cause of Christ here on earth, to do as much good as you can. And then, of course, your treasure. This is the principle of budgeting. Now, some people see the word budgeting and go, boring, not interested. I just live spontaneously. Like, as the Spirit moves me, then I just, I just live that way. Well, you'll be broke for the rest of your life living that way. Proverbs 21.5 says, plan carefully and you will have plenty. 
If you act too quickly, you will never have enough. And this is the problem with, with, with impulse buying. You've got to deal with, with the demon of impulse buying. That inner dark monster that moves you. Unplanned, emotional buying. You know, it's buying things you don't really need with money you don't really have. You've got to nip it in the budget. <laughs> Proverbs 21.20 says... Stupid people spend their money as fast as they get it. None of us here want to be stupid. Budgets are about planned spending, and it includes several things. First of all, it means living on a budget. It's not just planning it and sticking it in the drawer. You got to, it's telling your money where you want it to go. Don't let your money grow wings and fly away. You tell it where to go. Secondly, it involves setting up a repayment plan. Proverbs 3.27, don't withhold repayment of your debts. It takes time to get out of debt. It took time for you to accrue that debt and it's going to take time for you to get out of debt. You can pray all you like about it. God is good, sometimes he provides a miracle, but usually it's like, well, you've got to work the principle if you're going to believe him for provision. So God is good and he heals our bodies even when we violate like a person, I mean, I've prayed for people that are smokers and drinkers and gamblers and, and God does amazing things. But if they go back to their smoking and drinking and drug taking and gambling and you know what's going to happen? They're, they're going to get even worse. So you've got to, you've got to, there's got to be some, some changes to live God's way, to follow the right principles for health and right relationships. The same as with dealing with our finances. And so... It takes time to get out of debt. You, you've got to have be just as disciplined as with your savings plan. If you're disciplined with your savings plan, you've got to be disciplined with your debt reduction. That's why we're planning these two budget, three budget nights with one of the best budget organisers, Pastor David Washington, who's our CRC State Secretary. He specialises in this. So next Tuesday and Wednesday night, these are for free, practical tips for budgeting debt reduction. And, and so uh, on Tuesday night, Wednesday night, some people said to me, they went to one of David's about five or six years ago and it really helped them. And these people are really intelligent together people at the 8.30 service. And, and he goes, I really needed it. I said, you, I'd, I'd be surprised. He and his wife are really together people, highly intelligent, top job, because yes, we needed it. We weren't doing it the right way. I think I'll get him up next week to give a testimony at the 8.30 service. So David's going to be here to do two hours on this and you need it. Thirdly, it involves making a will. Do you know 50% of Australians don't have a will? Wow. If you don't have a, a will, you need to make one as soon as possible. And we've asked David to show you how to do it. I, I, yesterday I was at the post office and I bought their latest will kit for people who are single, people who are married. I'm going to read that through again. I've got an old one that I use. And uh, so if you haven't done a will, David will show you how to do it. And you don't have to go through expensive lawyers to do it. There's some sound principles. And uh, it might be good for you to go to your bank manager if, you, if you've got a good relationship and let them see it. But uh, you, you need to do it. Romans 13 says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. See, having a will is telling my money where I want it to go when I die. And if you don't do it, the government will decide for you. And anyone can make a claim against it. So, Arnie Flo, who you haven't spoken to in 10 years, and she's not the nicest person, she could say, well, I know them and, and, and I've had a relationship with them. She can make a claim, they could give her 10%. They don't know. So it's best to specify. I've specified my four kids. I've specified my six grandchildren. I've specified grandchildren that are yet to be born. One's on the way. And that little girl's going to be in the will. I've specified a fifth of my estate goes to our perpetuity fund here at the church so that I can still keep giving, Kath and I can still keep giving even when we're in heaven. And the church can't spend the money, only the interest they can use for ministry purposes. So that's, that's fantastic, the smart. And uh, so I think it's, it's really important. Um, there are people in our church here who are just fabulous in the way they handle finances. And uh, uh, one, of, one of the ladies that I spoke to just the other week, and I said, you've got to give a testimony. That's Brenda Giles. Brenda, would you like to come forward? And uh, 
I want you to share. Now, I've chosen Brenda. And tonight's service, I've got Adrian Cottrell sharing. Because Adrian was the total slacker as a, as a, as a young person. <laughs> yeah, free and easy. Yeah, whatever will be, will be. Then he married a Clinton. <laughs> and everything changed. Not quite right. And so he's done really well. He's going to share tonight. But Brenda, you, you and Tim, your brother... Um, I've been in the church here, you know, 20 years as such, and uh, I'm so impressed with you as a person. For those who don't know Brenda, she works at the uh, Royal Adelaide, and she serves here in in many and various ways, quietly behind the scenes. And um, Brenda, I was so impressed what you shared about finances. So who taught you about money matters? Um, I was very uh, privileged to be... um born into a um, a family where my uh, parents are both Christians and so they taught me from when I was quite a small child that, you know, put money in the offering bowl every week. Um, When I uh, started work at, uh, you know, just 17 going on 18, I remember um, as a nurse I had to um, live in at the, the hospital and Dad came and sat on the end of my bed and he said, now you need to make a budget. And he went through all of the things that should be in a budget. So tithing was at the top. Um, Putting savings into um, a separate account so that uh, they would build up over time. Um, Paying your board and lodging. Um, That sort of developed into then paying a mortgage once I became a landowner. Um, Groceries. Um, Even um, money for entertainment because I love to go and see films. Um, Keeping a certain amount of money in the day-to-day account in case of emergency, like your car breaks down. Um, Paying off the credit card before the due date so you're not paying interest. Um, And it's turned into a lifetime habit. So your mum and dad, like my parents, Mm. were good role models and helped you. And um, sadly, a lot of people don't have those good role models and they don't have a good hand up. Mm. But that's where... They can make changes. Um, Brenda, how have you... I mean, you own property, you, you, you're debt-free. Um, you know, you did that at a, at a reasonable age. Um, how have you handled debt like to, as a principle in life? Um, well, I had a credit card, but when a debit card Could came Could we just in, be louder, guys? Um, I actually um, s- uh, swapped over to a debit card so that I'm not paying for big items on credit, um, I'm actually paying for them on money that I've already got in the bank. So you're not um, paying any interest on them? Not paying any yeah. interest on them. Um, and that sort of leaves me money to, you know, like sponsor a child to go to um, the, the camp that's coming up. Um, I mean, I don't have children, but, um, you know, so I've got spare money for that. Um, I... Um, once I'd finished my nurse training, I actually moved back home with my parents and I bought a flat. So um, I had um, people paying rent for a, a year before I actually moved So your moved parents out. let you stay in, at their house? Oh, uh, yes. Did you have to pay any rent home? Oh, yes. Oh. Wooden lodging. Okay. It's right up there on the budget. Now, look, I, I encourage all our, all our young people, once you get married and you want to buy a property, OK, don't rent. Go back home. Get your parents to build on another room. Put you there. And if they're, if they're good parents, they will do that. If, if you're a rotten kid and you take advantage of your parents, they won't do it. But if you're a good kid, then, then do it. And do you know what? You can pay 300 bucks a week rental. You work that out over three years rental. And if you buy a property, you might be paying 400 bucks a week. So get it dumped. Don't get it. And, and if your parents can help you, then bless them, be a good kid. And, you, and, and, and parents, if you can help your kids to do that, uh, I think it's important because then if you can get a place early, you're again being smart. And that's where families help. And look, Greeks do this a lot. The Jewish community do it a lot. And Anglos 
It's not a habit, but I encourage you to, 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 to do it. Oh, actually, the, the, uh, actually, Mick Hutchfield's an exception. So, um, hey, this, so this, I, I'm now I'm preaching. Now, now back to you, Brenda. Tell well, us what happened. Well, this Anglo family did as well, because Tim kept moving back home until he was about 45, when my parents decided that next time he was coming to live with me. So, it, so Tim came to live back home to his parents, and they yeah. kicked him out and put him with you? Yeah. OK, that's smart. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so I, I actually bought a flat, um, yeah, and then I sold that and bought a house. And it was a small house on a small piece of land, but it's in Grange, so it's a good area. And, um, you know, I've been able to pay it off. I haven't had a mortgage larger than $70,000. Yeah. Well, you've worked really smart. Brenda, mm -hmm. finally, just on, on this, um, has it worked for you, like following God's pattern, the, 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 the five... Principles. The sixth one I'm going to do is to enjoy what you have. Yeah. You know, like, like God's not a killjoy. He wants us to enjoy what we have. So, so has it worked for you following God's pattern? Yes. Um, I mean, I've supported a number of missionaries um, throughout my life. Um, I've, um, I've supported my brother Tim. Um, many of you may not know, but um, he was a missionary overseas for about uh, 14 years. Um, he was on um, a ship called the Doulos, so he was in many uh, countries. And when he'd come home on furlough, he'd be coming home from um, all different parts of the world. Um, so he um, didn't have the money to pay for um, airfares, so um, I could pay for those because I, I had the money um, uh, to spare. Um, and um, also he um, came back um, to actually study down in Launceston and do a uh, diploma of marine engineering. Um, and I said to him, I'll pay for all your courses. You do whatever courses you want to do in the, in the three years. And I was able to do that. And he also managed to fit in a fitting turning um, Fantastic. apprenticeship as I well. I wish I had a sister like her. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. You are a great example. And look, tell me, if you just kind of... That's all you've done, and like you just stay home, you work, stay home, and don't enjoy what God has given to you? Are you a bit of a killjoy? Remember the savings in the budget? Um, by embracing um, the tithing, um, I've been blessed by God. Um, he's ensured that I've had a job where I've had a pay rise every year since I started just over 40 years ago. And um, I've um, travelled. Um, widely. Um, I've travelled um, around Australia um, and as an introvert, because you know one of my jobs is up in the booth, which I like being by myself, um, I can't be a missionary overseas. Um, I'm not an evangelist by any stretch of the imagination, but I can pay for Tim to go. I get to pray for him and I get to share in the outcome. And you've also visited 24 countries overseas. Yes, that'd be right. Yeah, fantastic. There's nothing wrong with that. It's good. You are a great example of somebody who has followed God's pattern and it's worked for you. So let's put our hands together for, for her. Bless you. <laughs> hey, I think it's important. You know, when I was talking about impulse buying, some of you go, ooh. This is me. I'm with Kathy. I can be anywhere in the world. We're walking together. Bookshop. Stimulus response. I go. I see a book. 30, 30 bucks later, I buy it and it gathers dust for the next six months on my. Six years. Six years, sorry, okay. <laughs> so. If one of you has that, you have my permission to grab that person by the ear and take them the other way. You've got to control the impulse buying and you'd be surprised. 30 bucks for a book. You work out what that can do overseas in a feeding program for children. You might think it's not a, not a big amount. There's nothing wrong with buying books. There's nothing wrong with going overseas. And this is the final point. Enjoy what you have. It's the principle of contentment. If God gives us wealth, Ecclesiastes says, and property, and lets us enjoy them, we should be grateful and enjoy what we have worked for. It is a gift from God. There's nothing wrong with that. But rather than focusing all our attention 
and energy on making more and more and more and more enjoy what you have. And I was thrilled to hear that, that Brenda has traveled around Australia, she's done 24 countries, and there's nothing wrong with that. And you can do that when you've actually managed your finances, and, uh, but most people can't because they're forever trying to get out of debt. Hey, listen, your happiness is not determined by how much you have. It's determined by your response to what you have. And some of the richest people are the unhappiest. Some of the poorest people financially are the happiest. It depends on a spirit of contempt, and I could share a whole message on this one. So, as a final challenge to us, God wants us to align ourselves to his order in every department of our lives, and particularly with our finances. And I want you to encourage you to dedicate, dedicate it all to him, your life your finances. And how do you do that? Is by, by, by saying, look, I'm going to start tithing the first 10% to Jesus. I'm going to start doing it. I'm going to start saving at least 10%. Or if you can't 10%, do five by saving it, by repaying it. Work out, not just repaying the interest. You do your sums. You go to your bank manager. And if you've got a loan over 15, 20 years and you're only paying back the interest, you are paying the bank. You've got to pay the principal off and, and reduce the number of years. And it's scary. It really is scary to see uh, how much we actually pay the banks. I mean, my wife and I discovered that our super, my super scheme, that the, the organisation that came out of the Banking Royal Commission, was scamming us and thousands of other people by charging an inordinate amount of fees. And, and I'm a fairly intelligent person, but I'm not fully engaged in that. Kathy is busy. She, she's, she's my steward. She manages a little bit, but you've got to get expert advice. So we've shifted our, my super from this one company to another company. This doesn't slug, it's slug those huge fees. And, and we're able... So you've just got to be, get informed. And so it's not a question... Some of us are so busy, we're just not informed. You've got to get informed. You've got to get to see a, a good, sound financial planner. Go to your bank manager. Talk to people who are in the know. And, uh, and so I think, I think this is so, so important. Uh, so tithe 10%. This is how you dedicate yourself to him. If you save 10%, repay it. What's your debt? Get yourself out of debt as soon as possible. And then enjoy it. Learn to live contentedly and gratefully. So this message is really all about life management and not just about money management. And money's a test of how responsible and accountable I am as a person. Look at Luke 16, 30, 11. This is the scripture I read last week. So if you've been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches, Jesus says? So our rewards and our responsibilities in heaven... You can read this parable, Luke 16, Matthew 25. Our rewards and our responsibilities in heaven, not how we get to heaven. That's by the grace of Jesus through his death on a cross. And as we have believed upon him and received him as our saviour, it's free grace. But your rewards and responsibilities will be determined by how you have managed your life here on earth and what you've done with the gifts that he has given to you and how faithful you've been to them. If you ignore God's laws you're not prosper in life. So can we switch to his plan? Let's stand together. I want to lead you in a prayer. Can we switch to his plan? Which one of the six financial laws are you not aligned to? Let's reflect for a few moments. None of us have it all together. God's not condemning you. He's not pointing the finger at you saying, bad girl, bad boy. Hey, listen, we, got, we were ripped off regarding our, our superannuation. We didn't know. We were just ignorant, just didn't know. So, so we, we, we've got to, to get informed and get help. And some of you are saying, oh, budgetary seminar, you need to come next Tuesday and Wednesday and, or Wednesday night. If you haven't done a budget, we will show you how to do that. Well, not me, Pastor David. If you haven't done a will, you need to be shown how to do that and to protect what God has given to you. Uh, otherwise, the government's going to do it for you. If you die, you don't have it. The government will do it for you. And they'll take a huge cut and anyone else can make a claim on it. To follow God's plan, where do you need to realign yourself? To remember that he's your source? Honour him first to commence the tithing principle? Folks, 
for those of us that have done this for years, tithing, none of us have gone without. It's, it's a paradox. It seems like, how can, I, how can I afford to give 10%? You can't afford not to. Because you, you, you tie God's hand from blessing you. You start aligning yourself to him. And it's amazing what takes place. And if you start saving faithfully and learn to get out of debt and you keep good records and get a budget, plan your spending, and then you'll have enough to bless Jesus, bless his church, bless the poor, the needy, look after your family and enjoy what you have. So which one of these six are you not aligned to? I encourage you, get aligned, make a decision, commit yourself today to developing good habits and follow God's plan. Some of you, I'm very conscious, you're in stress, you're in pain. You've, ah, it's like, if only I heard this 10 years ago or 15 years ago. You're on a vortex where you've never been able to get on top of this. Don't despair. God knows. He loves you. He wants to help you. And he can supernaturally change things miraculously. And he's very merciful. But usually his power and grace works within the principles that we employ. And it's not either. He wants to help you. If you're facing stress, if you're in pain at the moment, I feel for you. I know that, uh, look, that there are people out in our community that commit suicide over this. Seriously, in our farming communities. One of the highest incidences of, of suicide has been brought on, the mental health issue, been brought on by acute financial stress. It's terrible, particularly for men. Let's just close our eyes for a moment. No one looking around. If I'm talking to you and you are in financial stress, let me say God loves you and he wants to help you. You're facing pain right now. I'd love to particularly pray for you. If that's you, just between God, you and me, lift your hand up. I'd like to see it. I'd like to pray for you. If you know you, you're, you're in some difficulty right now, lift your hand up. It could be job. It could be finance. It could be debt. Lift your hand up high and I'll see it. That's good. Great. Good on you guys. Be, be courageous. You're identifying. You're saying, I'm in need. Lord, help me. Let's pray together. Father, I, I pray for every person who's put their hand up and those who, who wanted to put their hand up but haven't. Lord, you know them. You love them. And each of them have a personal story of how they've got into where they're at. And, and Lord, you want to rewrite that story and to help them out of it. Give them relief, Lord, from their stress and pain. Help them to follow your plan. Help them to make a start today. And Lord, supernaturally, enable them to turn around their financial situation. Lord, in the long term, enable them to replace debt with deliverance. And, and the pressure they feel, may you touch them with your spirit of peace right now. Their frustrations that they have, Lord, give them freedom. Give them a vision of freedom, as we've heard this wonderful story from Brenda. The tension they feel, help them, Lord, to put their trust in you and in your word that doesn't lie and that you teach us how to live in this area. Do a miracle in our lives, Lord. Help us to align to your ways. Bless every person. Touch them. Fill them with your Holy Spirit and power. Help them to love your word as they take the outline of this message, as they read the verses. Continue to speak to them and feed their faith and inspire their hearts to want to serve you this way and to align themselves to your way of living. Let's sing this song together.